Hey there, good morning and welcome to Reunion Church. My name is Arthur and I'm a core team member here at Reunion. We're so excited that you decided to join us this morning for our online service as we continue to meet virtually. Uh, before we go into scripture reading, I do have a couple of announcements for you. The first is there will be no virtual lobby time today. And the second is that we have been planning a lot for the fall and we have two groups that we are announcing that will begin in the month of September. The first is called Alpha. Alpha is a series of interactive sessions that explore the basics of Christianity. So we're going to be tackling life's biggest questions from a Christian perspective. And after that, we'll have a discussion on the topic without any judgment or fear. We'll begin September 14th. It's a Monday night at 8 p.m. over Zoom. It's going to be a 10 week long program, and it's a great course to invite a friend to. Uh, click the link below to sign up. The second group is called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. This group will explore the connection between emotional and spiritual health. Some of the topics we will go through include finding authentic self, how our family of origin affects us, how to slow down, embracing grief and loss, etc. And this group will meet on Wednesday nights starting September 16th at 8 p.m. over Zoom, and it'll last eight weeks. Now for the scripture reading. It comes from Matthew 5, 1 through 9. Read along with me. The version is English Standard Version. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. This is the word of the Lord. Hey, welcome. So glad that you are tuning in. I'm Russell. I'm the pastor here at Reunion, and we're so looking forward to this fall. Like Arthur was just talking about, we're excited to connect um, virtually and uh, possibly in person for those who feel comfortable and uh, as we abide by proper safety measures and uh, limited sizes. And uh, as Arthur was just sharing uh, with our, our groups, if you've never been in a group like this before, this is a great opportunity uh, to explore authentic Christianity. It's a place to be known, um, to share as much or as, middle, uh, as little as you'd like, and, and truly just a, a place to uh, be yourself. And so you know, I, I'm glad that you're listening here, but obviously, um, you know, you hearing from one person uh, has its limitations. But as we enter into groups, into space, spaces like this, we have opportunities for mutual learnings and where we're growing from um, different voices. We're hearing um, from different perspectives. We're reading the scriptures and we're getting um, multiple eyes on, on what the text is saying. And these are good ways to really understand what following Jesus is. Is about and so please explore um, click the links below sign up if you have any questions about what uh, those particularly look like don't hesitate um, to ask and so uh, today what I want to do is I want to finish our summer series two weeks ago we talked about um, having this deep inner peace and today what I want to talk about is as that begins to overflow what it looks like for us as people to become peacemakers um, in, in really a moment of, of outrage in, in, in 2020. So let me uh, just pray as we begin. So glad that you're here. God, I love you. And um, as I just pray right now, I just am I'm blown away that you are faithful and that you're good. And even when times are hard, um, like they have been, um, we trust that you are still at work. And so um, right now as I speak, uh, would you just put aside the distractions? This isn't about us. This isn't about me. But this is about you and what you've done and the deep implications that it has for us as people. So we, may we believe that right now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So um, I know we largely live in a, a visual culture. The oral culture gave way to visual culture, especially um, with our phones in our pocket. But we still live in, in a time that's really entrenched in words. In fact, I'd say it's simply words hold weight. Uh, in 280 characters or less, um, 
not, not by me, but um, they can drive the, the stock market up or down. 280 words or less can, can start a war in our time. 280 characters or less can um, expose a past m misconduct or can kill a business. Uh, 280 characters or less can create awareness or can bring hope. They can prove a point or shame another person. Uh, 280 characters or less, uh, we know this all too well, can lose a friend or can break a heart. And so words hold weight. And in the midst of 2020, there is so much to be said of, of public discourse, um, confirmation bias, cancel culture. And I think what this, these ideas and these words actually begin to reveal to me is that we're not all that great at relational conflict. And so today what I want to do is I want to sort of um, get into the nitty gritty of peacemaking, into really the emotional and the personal side of peacemaking. In, in 25 or, or, or 30 minutes, uh, in, in that amount of time, we're not going to be able to get into the nuances of, of peacemaking, global peacemaking, um, peacemaking and justice, peacemaking and forgiveness and all these things. But what I really want to do is I began to study this. I realized that um, the benefits of what Jesus is saying is actually um, can be personal and can have, have profound impact on um, how we dialogue and uh, how we have conflict with others. And this, this actually really comes from a personal place in me as well. Recently, I was sitting outside of a cafe reading and I started texting a close friend of mine. And um, really quickly and sort of out of nowhere, the debate um, turned, uh, the conversation turned into a debate um, about modern politics, uh, race relations, uh, fiscal ideologies. And I grew up with this with this friends, and I knew over the last couple of years that we had been diverging on specific topics. But as we uh, continued to text, I realized that um, this gap had really widened. And I knew I knew that this was the case because I actually sitting there and texting my friend, I began to react bodily. I was I was upset. I was getting frustrated. I actually um, had this tension inside of me. My body temperature. Um, was rising and I felt the need to put my book down, to grab my computer and um, to start researching, to, to start send articles, to send charts and graphs and peer reviewed studies and all kinds of information that proved my point and send it the other way. And in return, I, I, I began to get some of the same. I was getting charts and of course I was getting memes making fun of me. Um, and I, I sent some of those memes back, but the conversation really began to spiral into personal jabs, red herrings, and um, it really disappointed me in a lot of ways. I disappointed me in a lot of ways. And I, I can look back over the conversation and, and, and I can stand by much of my conclusions and um, these discourses that many of us are having are not inherently wrong, but what I realized in looking back at it is, is something in me was. And so when we talk about peace or, or peacemaking, we can sort of uh, talk about it as, a, as an ethereal idea out there, but we know peacemaking as something far more personal and something far more emotional uh, or, or something with far more uh, emotional implications in our life. And I think as we, as a culture, collectively give into the consumer culture where competition really rules the day, what we are thereby going to have is conflict and rivalry, these things are going to begin to surface. And so what is the, um, the alternative to that? And that's what Jesus is presenting here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And so Matthew's chapters, um, chapter 5 through 7, if you were to pull that out, uh, pull it up on your phone or, or look in the Bible, what you find is it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And what Jesus is doing here is he's, he's holding up an expectation. He's holding up a, a vision of an, an alternative kingdom, um, his kingdom that he is looking to in, inaugurate. And what it looks like from the outside, if you were to, to, to pull Matthew chapter 5 through 7 up, is it, it would actually look like a series of ethical teachings. Jesus saying, this is how you should live. And, and, in, and, in, and in some ways, it definitely is that. But Jesus is actually giving us a greater vision. And what, what uh, Matthew chapters 5 through 7 begin with is our section that Arthur read there that's called the Beatitudes. And Jesus begins to, to give us a series of people who are blessed. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are meek. And you might see this and say, well, like, no. Like, Jesus, actually, like, your sentence is actually an oxymoron. Those people are not 
blessed. And so what, what is it that Jesus is, is trying to say here? And blessed, while, while sort of a beautiful way of making this statement, is actually a bit of a misleading translation. This text, uh, happy is sort of a better word. Happy is this person, for they will be. Happy is. And uh, what, what's happening here is, is Jesus is describing not a mental state, but a condition of life as it is lived out. It's not showing who God blesses, but rather it's introducing a way of happiness. One commentator I, I read noted that this is not a, a psychological description, but it's a recommendation on how to live this out. And so Jesus says, happy are the peacemakers. And so what are the, the factors in that? And I just want to look at this in, in three ways. I want to look at the motivations in our peacemaking. I want to look at the, the deformations in our peacemaking. And then lastly, we'll look at, in a really practical way, how to be peacemakers. And so let's first look at the motivation. Jesus says, blessed or happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Well, if you, as you read that, the first question becomes, why are peacemakers called sons of God? Who, well, who does a son represent, right? Sons share in the characteristics of of their father. And so I'm Russell Jr. If you were to meet Russ Sr., you would look at him and you begin to say, in what ways is Russell uh, Sr. similar to Russell Jr.? I, I don't only carry my father's name, but in, in, in part, I am a reflection or a mirror of him in different ways, in, in, in maybe possibly physical characteristics. It could be in mannerisms. Um, it could be personality traits. Uh, it could literally be in the ways in which I handle conflict. We learn these things um, from our family and, and, and the ways in which we were raised. And so what Jesus is actually saying here is God is a God of peace. We, we find that throughout the scriptures, that God is peace. In fact, uh, Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, For he, Jesus, himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So he's saying, if God is peaceful, if that's the characteristic of who God is, then we as people should actually represent him in our peacemaking. And so in terms of motivation, what he's saying is, we are to live and act a certain way in the world because of who God is and what God has done. And because God is a peacemaker, we Two, in turn, should be peacemakers. And so I want to I want to pause here actually, because this is actually an immensely helpful way in understanding the Christian faith, and 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 I think it's very easy to minimize the the Christian faith, or really it's easy to distill Christianity as a whole into a handful of ethical or moral principles, especially when reading Matthew chapter five through seven. It's easy to take um, these principles and say, okay, this is how to be a good person. But that's not actually the Christian faith. Christianity never, never, never begins with what we do for God. It always starts with what God has done for us and achieved in Jesus Christ through the, the perfect life, the, the death, uh, the burial, the three days, and then the ultimate resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we begin to understand that message, we say, my motivation for peacemaking does matter. It's not just to be a good person. It's not just to have a, a more ethical or moral world, but actually I am mirroring a God of peace. And so also in terms of our motivation, it's important to understand in peacemaking what we are talking about and what we're not talking about. We're, we're, when we're talking about peacemaking, we're not talking about quick solutions. We're not talking about suppressed emotions. We're not talking about uniformity or agreement on everything. Jesus here is, is called our peace. But as you read the scriptures, you, you actually learn that peacemaking is very nuanced because Jesus in the scriptures, if you go back and re read through them, you find that conflict and tension and trouble were actually central to the life and mission of Jesus. And we sort of get this misleading picture of Jesus if we're not reading that, because what, what we do is we, we sort of project onto Jesus things that we hear from culture or you know from other people. And what we do is we actually find that um, culturally, Jesus is like this nicer, less white version of, of Mr. Rogers, but that's not, uh, that's not Jesus. And, and we actually it can, can falsely project these uh, notions of peace that Jesus never gave. 
And Jesus re rejected these constantly. He did this with the crowds, with the religious leaders, with the Romans, with his own um, disciples. In, in fact, in, in Matthew chapter 10, the same book where in, in chapter 5, Jesus says, you are to be peacemakers. And then uh, that's chapter 5. And in, in, in chapter 10, um, Jesus says this, do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And so Jesus is like this, this polarizing figure. He's creating this tension. He's willing to get uncomfortable uh, for, for the truth. And he's not going to settle for false notions of what peace is. And I think this is really um, helpful for, for us today because we live in this tension, right? We live in this reality of knowing that you know, tension and conflict are our lived experiences. And so Jesus is coming to disrupt false notions of peace and give us a reality of what that looks like. Uh, for, for us, unresolved conflicts are, are some of the greatest tensions of our lives today. Most of us hate conflict. We don't know what to do with conflict. And instead of um, risking any more broken relationships, we actually um, prefer to ignore difficult issues and we settle for sort of a false peace where where tension is ignored it's like swept under a rug like like dust like how i clean and and what happens behind that is gossip and bitterness and and jealousy actually end up lingering in the background and so if this is the motivation for our peacemaking where is it that where is it that we go wrong or what are the the deformations in this and i just want to talk about two things here the first being is that we mistake peacemaking and peacekeeping and then the second one is that we, we actually um, have an inability to see outside of ourselves. So this first one is that we mistake peacemaking and peacekeeping. So I am um, a child of divorced parents and any kid of divorced parents can, can tell you that um, by nature of the situations, like we got PhDs in peacekeeping. Um, for a lot of us, we had to function as a go between between our parents. And so we feared a lot of conflict. Uh, oftentimes, especially if we had siblings, we went along with whatever was easiest as to not bring worry or anxiety to our parents. And so growing up in my family, we didn't know how to be um, peacemakers or to handle conflict because we didn't do conflict. We we did peacekeeping or, 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 or we did blow up fights like zero or a hundred. And in our families, if we don't or didn't do conflict, then it's likely that we are unaware of what we are actually experiencing personally when we face conflict. Oftentimes when we enter into conflict, um, we want it to be over as quickly as possible because we want people to like us. We, we want their validation. And maybe I should just say this um, for, for myself here is that oftentimes when I enter a conflict, I want it to be over as quickly as possible because I want to be perceived as easygoing, enjoyable, fun to be around. And, and as, I, as I think about this and as I admit these things, I have to realize also that this is not what Jesus had in mind when it came to, to, comes to peacemaking. So what, what's, like, what's the difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking? What if peacekeepers are like thermometers and peacemakers are like thermostats? What do I mean by that? Peacekeepers, like thermometers, they understand the spiritual and the emotional temperature of a room, but like a thermometer, a peacekeeper does not have the ability to change the temperature or the atmosphere of a room. So they enter a room, a peacekeeper enters a room and comes under what is already there. But a peacemaker, on the other hand, is like a thermostat. They initiate the needed temperature uh, and change that the room needs. And they do it with wisdom intact. And that's why there can be true peace. And so a peacekeeper, they desire to maintain peace by avoiding conflict. They, they give in to tension or, or they steer clear of disagreement simply to keep other people happy because they hate rocking the boat. And, and by nature, what you find is that this is actually a very passive way of, of living life. In fact, uh, I, I, I've done this before. I've apologized for things that I haven't even done so that the conflict can be over as quick as possible. And, and what we actually find in, in understanding what a peacekeeper is and what a peacekeeper is doing is it's ultimately selfish. I want something in me to be okay. And so I want to end this as quickly as possible. And I, I know some of, I know we're virtual right now, but some of us need to uh, just feel the pain of what I just said. We need to just acknowledge, wow, I, I have some of these, these tendencies and um, I, I, I want to hear how to how to do this right
And this is where a peacemaker is different. This is a person who's willing to resolve the, not only the outer conflict, but the inner conflict as well to do the deep work of challenging themselves and others and pushing into conflict and tension um, to, to actually resolve it in order to establish a true peace. And so peacemakers are actually really proactive people willing to push in. And we'll talk about how to engage um, specifically in a minute. But um, some of us, while we think we're peacemakers, are actually peacekeepers. And we have to acknowledge the difference there. The other deformation I want to mention here in our peacekeeping is the inability to see outside of ourselves. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. And it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or, or vain conceit, but in an act of humility, consider others better than yourself or more significant than yourself. In our peacemaking or peacekeeping, for that matter, we often uh, think of ourselves before we think of other people. We're, we're, and, and we're doing that when we're attempting to prove a point, when we're making sure our thoughts are heard first, um, by making sure people affirm or stroke our ego in, in the midst of this. And what's so fascinating about the ways in which we dialogue um, in our time is that we largely judge ourselves by our intentions, but we judge other people by their actions. And one of the reasons we, we really don't do peacemaking is, is that we don't see the wrongdoing in ourselves, and we also don't allow grace to operate in other people's lives. We don't give them the benefit of the doubt when we're trying to prove our point. I love what Miroslav Volf um, says. He's a theologian. He says, forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans, even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. Uh, if you plug the word peacemaker in there, and, and I'm going to read this kind of slowly just to take it in. What if our peacemaking effort, efforts flounder because we exclude the enemy from the community of humans as we exclude ourselves from the community of sinners. And so often in conflict, what we do is we actually demonize other people, those who disagree with us. We don't allow grace to operate in their life. And by product, um, we never actually sought out real peace. But peacemakers consider other people before themselves. I love how Ronald Rollheiser puts it. He says, all of our actions for peace must be rooted in the power of love and the power of truth and must be done for the purpose of making that power known and not for making ourselves known. Our motivation must always be to, to open people to the truth and not to show ourselves as right and them wrong. Our best actions are those which admit our complicity and are marked by a spirit of genuine repentance and humility. Our worst actions are those that seek to demonstrate our own righteousness our own purity and our own moral distance from the violence we protest. And so it's good to push into the conflict, but a, a deformation along the way is how we are actually viewing other people. And so this is a perfect segue into this last part, which is how do we do this then? How do we become peacemakers? And I just wanna put forth um, three things. The first is this, is that we need to learn to listen like a peacemaker. In James chapter three, James um, famously is speaking about um, the tongue and, and what it does. He says this in, in verse four. He says, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire and the tongue is a fire a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. <laughs> like, whoa, that, that is a lot, right? But like I said in the beginning, James is saying, words hold weight. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls, uh, calls this the ministry of holding one's tongue. He wrote, often we combat our evil thoughts most effectively if we absolutely refuse to allow them to be expressed in words. The tongue is a fire. We use our words to encourage and to enrich, to speak life and to give hope and to spread love. And then simultaneously out of the same mouth comes gossip, hate, and jealousy. And so a simple challenge, if, if we want to become peacemakers, we have to grow in the area of listening. Another way to grow in peacemaking, especially right now, I think is that we need to social media like a peacemaker. 
And here, I'm not, I'm not telling you how to uh, use social media, but I'm saying that we need to decide on our intentions with the usage of social media, define how we'll use it, and then move forward from there and stick and stick with it. In that uh, same James passage, James chapter three, in verse 17, he really gives us an amazing litmus test for how we engage on social media. He says, but the wisdom from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And heading into the, the fall election season, the coronavirus, you know, we're at our homes, um, you know, we're, we're on our phones more than ever. I think we really need an intentional um, social media strategy, define the ways that in which we're going to use it. And the litmus test that I'm talking about is just asking this question, ask, is my social media engagement pure? Is it peaceable? Is my social media engagement gentle? Is it open to reason? Is it full of mercy? Is it full of good good fruit? Is it impartial? Is it sincere? And so, like I said, I don't know ways in which you need to engage with social media, but but choosing and being intentional about it, I think, is key. I don't know if you've heard of the um, 90, 9, and 1 rule. It's that 1% of users on social media are creators. They're driving the content. Um, they're, they're the ones actively engaged, pushing out contents, um, threads, and activity. It's actually generally around 1%. Then uh, the 9% are editors. They're sometimes modifying content. They're sometimes contributing to the threads, um, but they're rarely creating content from scratch. And then um, the, the other 90%, um, some places call them the audiences. Uh, we'll call them the lurkers. I, I've been one of those before. Um, but these are the people that tend to read and observe and and sort of lurk and they don't actively can contribute. And my challenge is, is um, to engage or, or to delete. And the challenge to myself is to, to actually engage more in certain platforms and then get off or, or delete others. But that's how um, we can social media like a peacemaker. And then here's this last one. And this is like really nuts and bolts, dialogue based, um, person to person, but um, clean fighting, fight like a peacemaker. In, uh, in emotionally healthy relationships, Pete and Gary, Jerry Schizero, uh, who are here in New York City um, from New Life Fellowship, and um, some of the content we're actually going to be going through in that Wednesday night group um, starting in, in September, they put forth a way of handling conflict that pursues forgiveness and reconciliation and, and this true peace. And it is not passive in any way. And I just kind of want to walk through this framework that they put forth in what's called clean fighting. And I, I actually put this in my phone as a, a, a conflict um, management tool and something I can go back to a framework. And so there's uh, eight steps that they list out. I'm just going to talk about six of them here. Um, but the step number one is to ask permission to do a clean fight with someone. And I know that sounds a little bit foreign, but I, I'm, I'm willing to, to push in to try this. And so step one, ask permission. Step two, state the problem. And so start a sentence with this, I notice. And so you're starting uh, a conflict um, by describing a concrete behavior. And this helps in not um, uh, provoking a defensive response. And so you're actually saying a concrete behavior. I noticed you didn't do the dishes after you said that you were going to. I, I noticed you um, didn't arrive when you said you were going to. And so you're, you're saying that you notice a concrete behavior. And step three, State why it is important to you. And so you're starting this sentence with I value. And here what you're doing is you're talking about what your value is and how that is fueling the conflict for you. And so um, if a person didn't do the dishes, you're saying I value follow through in what you said you were going to do. Or I value a quick text if you're going to be late. And what you're doing is you're beginning to state why it is important to you. Step four, you're filling in the following sentence, when you blank, I feel blank. And so you're describing your own feelings and you're actually taking responsibility for why this is your problem and not their problem with your feelings. When you did this, I felt disrespected. When you showed up late, I felt as though my time wasn't respected. When you, I feel. And then step five, state clearly, respectfully, and specifically your request. I would like to ask you to shoot me a text if you know you're going to be late. I would like you to follow through with the commitments that you have already made. And then there's a few more steps, but step six, um, we'll just call it step six. Find a mutually agreeable way 
to move forward. Allow the person to respond, listen to um, you know, possibly why that didn't happen, and then find a way to move forward. And so to summarize, um, ask, ask permission to do a clean fight and then state, I noticed, I value. When you blank, I feel blank. And then I would like to ask you, and hopefully these are just some practical ways for us um, to grow in our dialogue and our conversation skills um, with others. And so let me pray for you. I hope this was helpful. I, I hope this is um, sparking um, conversation in your house and your, you know, in your brain. You're stewing over some of these ideas and you want to grow in this idea of peacemaking. So let's pray as we wrap up. God, I love you. And uh, truly our motivation for being peacemakers comes from the fact that, God, you have reconciled us um, to yourself through your son. And we have peace with you through your son. And because of that, um, we can be at peace internally, but we can also um, go out and be peacemakers. And so I pray that this, um, these ideas, these things that the scriptures um, would amount to real change for us, real growth and development um, in the ways that uh, we interact with other people, whether that be in person, online, and um, God, may that actually mean um, deep reconciliation um, with our family, um, with our parents, uh, with our friends, and uh, may it make all the difference that we do that. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Please don't forget to sign up for a fall group and keep up to date with us by following our Instagram and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Now, if you please bow your heads with me as we join into benediction. God, we are longing for a silent night for a reprieve from noise and anxiety and hurry, for a moment of space and time, empty yet full. Give us the gift of quiet. We look in your direction, God, the place from which peace comes, for you are its author and the home of its prince, and in your peace we dwell. Amen.